All right, so again, the concern about these two areas is positive feedback. Now, CO2 in the world ocean, okay. Obviously, 70% of the world is covered with water, with, with ocean water. And there is a large surface of water, and CO2 freely diffuses both, both ways across. When it gets in the water, it immediately reacts with the water molecule and stays in equilibrium with some other molecules, including the carbonate ion. And the carbonate ion is the only form of that that can be taken up in shelled creatures in salt water. So large ones that you can see, like mollusks and corals, and small ones like coccolithophores and others that are microscopic. Okay, so you have to have carbonate ion. So if the ocean pH changes, this is and the change in ocean pH is sometimes called the equally evil twin to global warming. If the pH changes, there's less carbonate ion available. It starts changing down to here. In a pretty subtle change in pH. pH is actually more variable than this. This is a blanket statement, the ocean pH is about 8.35. It actually varies with the season, it varies with the part of the world, and so forth. But some of these creatures are biochemically adept enough, they can sort of wait for a time when there happens to be um, a little bit higher pH, a little bit more of the carbonate ion available, and they quickly make shells during that time. But conversely, when it goes down, then you end up with dead coral like this. And, and uh, one time, I have had a chance to scuba in Hawaii in an area of coral that was really badly affected. And it's multifactorial, and there are other things besides the pH, okay? And we won't go into all the details, but other things. Okay, so Milankovitch, what character he was? Milut Milankovitch, Serbian, geophysicist and astronomer, gets conscripted into the military in World War I, is captured, not killed. And I don't know about you, but I think if I were a prisoner of war, I'd probably sit around playing poker for cigarettes or something. Well, not cigarettes, but you get the idea. Instead, he thought, well, you know, he's got some time to kill. And so he sat down with pencil and paper, pencil and paper, not a computer, and he looked at Newtonian, um, understanding of celestial mechanics, he said, okay, how would the variation of the orbit of Earth be explained by what else is going on in the solar system? And he found some answers, and he found three principal things. Now the workers besides um, Malakovich work on this. So the first is the eccentricity cycle. So we know the Earth does not go around the Sun in a perfect circle. It's actually more complex than two foci of the ellipse, and I don't want to go into all the geometry. But basically, this is exaggerated for effect. There's about a 2% variation in roundness. So sometimes less round, sometimes more round. When it's less round at perihelion, when it's closer to the sun, it gets more energy from the sun. This, even though the sun is not putting out more energy, it's just closer to it. But then at aphelion, the farthest point away in its orbit, it gets a lot less. And it's just enough more, or a loss there, that you actually get if you have a more elliptical and less rounded, almost rounded orbit, um, it changes the amount of radiation that will actually fall on the Earth. So this is the one of the three that actually <coughs> changes by about 0.2%. That's about 0.45 watts per square meter. So it's a pretty small effect that's been going on for billions of years. And it happens mainly due to gravitational fields of Jupiter and Saturn. There are times when they kind of gang up and force the, the Earth to go into a little bit different orbit. The next one is the obliquity or tilt. Now this is not a 100,000 year cycle, there's actually more than one cycle here, that's the main one, but a 41, well, 41,000 year cycle. It turns out the axis of the Earth varies a little bit. If it were exactly vertical, <coughs> perpendicular to the plane of rotation around the Sun, what would happen? No, that's a real question. What would happen if it were exactly vertical? No seasons. No seasons. Would that not be boring? The tropics would be much hotter, the poles would be permanently frozen, it'd be a very different planet, and boring. You wouldn't know when to start baseball season, for example. <laughs> All right, so it turns out the axis varies between 22.2 and 24.5, and we are here right now, 23.5, so we're kind of in the midpoint of the cycle, but here's the point. Obviously, the orientation of the planet does not change the amount of sun's energy that's hitting it, but it does change the distribution of the sun's energy. So that, for example, if you're more at 24.5, you're more likely to melt the polar ice. Now, why should that be? If it's more... If it's more oblique, um, more tilted, um, it doesn't matter what the temperature is in the winter, right? It doesn't matter if it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. As long as it's sub-freezing and it's cloudy and the sun hardly hits, nothing's going to melt. But the summers are key. So the more tilt, the more summer exposure. And so the more melting of, of the glaciers, ice, and so forth. Question? Yeah. Does the tilt affect the albedo effect at all? Yes. And that's what does it. 
by melting ice, which is very reflective. Fresh snow reflects about 90% of the light coming to it. Not infrared, but that's where I'll get to later. About 90%. So yes. And so then you often end up with, say, dark water, which is very absorbent, absorbing of the sun's energy so far. All right. Now, if we know that the greater tilt makes for a warmer planet, which way are we going now? More tilted or less? Less. Yes. Oh, good, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the, so, should we be getting warmer or colder based on that particular we should, we should be getting colder. We should be getting colder. Should be getting colder. So it shows that the, the anthropogenic effects, the human caused effects, are more potent than the celestial cycles. Now, the third one, precession, 23 year cycle, this is due to the tidal forces of sun and moon. We've all had seen a top that's spinning fast and that slows down and it suddenly starts to jerk sideways and jerk sideways. This does not change the amount of sun's energy coming, but it does change our north star. So the one we're used to right now, only 13,000 years from now, it's going to be Vega instead of Polaris. I don't even know how to find Vega, but then I won't be here for 13,000 years. So I guess that's a good point. All right. So my question is, how much variation in global mean surface temperature is based on orbital forcings? Now, the next slide, I want you to look at the red circles. Ready? Here we go. Look at the red circles. Tell me, in your mind's eye, is that pretty much the same as that, and that the same as that? Yes. Do those overlap? Barb, you're not allowed to answer. You've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> OK, seriously, though, do, will you accept my point that those look pretty close? Yes. All right. Pretty close. So <coughs> this first line right here, this is the combination of eccentricity, see the long cycle, tilt or obliquity and precession. Now this looks like V-tac, that looks like V-fifth. But anyway, if you combine those two together, that's the curve you get. Now, going back and looking, say, at oxygen 16 and 18 ratios, that's the surface temperature of the planet. So the Milankovitch cycles have a large but very, very slow role in changing the surface of the planet, changing the climate of the planet, and helping produce things like Snowball Earth and Hot House Earth. Now, there are many, many other things. Tectonic plate action changes where ocean currents go. There are methane releases. There is methane, there is carbon dioxide uptake, et cetera, et cetera. Carbon cycle is actually very complicated. But granted for now, that it looks like that the orbital changes for the planet actually have something to do with the surface of the climate of the planet. All right, so I will repeat again for a fact. This is one of the numbers you were supposed to remember from the beginning, remember? Eccentricity cycle alone uh, actually changes the amount of sunlight reaching that skin, that sphere, that top of the atmosphere. That's the only one that does it directly. The rest of it change the distribution of the sun's energy. All right, we know the top of the top of the atmosphere, our skin solar clock is 1366, and everything we're doing now in aggregate is tracking an extra 2.29 of that. That all clear so far? You will not even check in your heads. Yeah, it's like. All right. But the obvious question is, could the sun be doing this? Are we getting hotter because the sun is hotter? And obviously you know the answer. It's not getting hotter. Okay, so the solar variation is in several different things. Both the total amount of radiation and the spectral distribution. And it varies over years to millennia, to thousands of years. There's some periodic components, the main one being, of course, the 11 year solar cycle, the sunspot cycle. Now, we have really good data from astronomers going back centuries on the number of sunspots. And that's actually quite interesting. There was a time during the Middle Ages when there was the Mounder Minimum, where for about 70 years there were almost no sunspots. And it was a lot colder during that time. Because when the sunspots are active, here's our famous 1366, when the sunspots are more active, the sun's actually putting out a little bit more total energy. About 0.1%. That adds about 1.3 watts per square meter coming into the atmosphere. Okay, but here's the problem for people who think the sun is causing this. Um, that's too weak a change, and it's in the wrong direction. Our last solar maximum was 2001, and we're kind of delayed. It's been more than 11 years since then, right? We haven't gotten back to sunspot activity again. So there's variation on that. So the sun is not causing this change. Can't play the sun. No. So I already asked you that trick question, last ice age. Try to move these slides around. But, okay, so we are in an interglacial period of an ice age. Not a glacial period, but interglacial. Okay. And there's been fluctuating ice over the last 40 to 50 million years, been more intense for the last, uh, actually about two and, a, two and a half million years. Um, Northern Hemisphere glaciation has involved ice as deep as three to four kilometers. Four kilometers, that's about two and a half miles thick of ice. 
In fact, Antarctica is sitting on top of that, or sitting under that, I guess. Um, in the center of Antarctica, some of the ice is four kilometers thick, two and a half miles of ice. That's a lot of ice. All right. So this is some stuff about Puget Sound. This is one of the glaciers that we can drive a couple hours and hike to. And you can do that in Anchorage, too. I mean, a lot of places where you can see the glaciers have disappeared. This is probably the easiest thing to talk to people about and say that's evidence that the, that the Earth is, is, uh, is warming up because glaciers and, and ice are melting, sea levels rise, and so forth. All right, so our current interglacial has a name, it's called the Holocene Epoch, the last 11,700 years. And this is the whole time during which we have, our civilization has developed, and this is all that we're used to. It's all that we know. Um, it actually started warming a little bit about 5,000 years ago. Agriculture <coughs> developed about 8,000 years ago, it became more widespread 5,000 years ago. And that change in albedo and in land use probably started changing the temperature getting a little bit warmer. So again, I made the point before, tipping point on ice age, five to six degrees opposite direction. Now, in 2008, see the course of two ships that went over the top of the North American continent? Europeans have been trying to do that for about four centuries, right? The fabled Northwest Passage. Mm -hmm. Two ships went. One was an icebreaker. It turned out to be redundant, so they made it easily. Russia at this point, on the other side of the Arctic Sea, the sea ice is not depicted in this. We're not here yet. We're all gone. So, but the Russians are charging $300,000 a trip. Um, last year they did more than 30 ships that they escorted over the top of the Eurasian continent. Um, it saved multiple days of travel, lots of fuel. It was actually a bargain for ships to do that. So a lot of changes are going to be happening in the Arctic Sea. The American military is concerned about it as well. A lot of changes taking place. Another thing, <coughs> lightning. Did you know the tundra, called tundra in North America, it's called taiga in Eurasia. But that tundra-like vegetation, you don't think of that as having a forest fire. But that's a, that's a tundra fire, a tundra fire right there taking place. And apparently that hadn't happened for a couple hundred thousand years. If not happened. So the question now then, given what we know about the sun and the other things, why are we not, why are we getting warmer instead of colder right now? And the answer is threefold. But I first want to make a comment. I've done a lot of chainsaws in my day. <laughs> no helmet, no chaps, no gloves, not even wearing blue jeans. With chainsaws. I think crazy. Okay, now you can focus on the fact there's a very large tropical tree there, I grant you. So there are three basic issues going on. Aerosols tend to cool, net effect, and that actually is something that IPCC had a lot of, a lot, had to be a lot of debate for some years before they, they came down and said that that's true. Greenhouse gases would obviously make us warmer. Deforestation, which releases a lot of, which is a carbon sink released to the atmosphere, and desertification, desertification. Um, but then you also have, you raise the albedo. You start reflecting more light on. Again, mixed effects there. Overpopulation, and they did not choose a teeming third world city. I chose Seattle in a traffic jam. We think that population is only a third world problem, and it's not. But there's actually good news about that. Let's actually talk about overpopulation. Because all too often in these things, overpopulation is left out. And I'm going to personalize this a little. In that I was born in 1950, and there were two and a half billion people in the world. Now, up until kind of the early 1800s, no one, no one ever lived on the planet where the population doubled during their lifetime. But now I just have to hang in there for a few more years, Bart, and then it could triple in my lifetime. <laughs> so, that's an dilemma. Now, notice obviously this curve is going, no laser, I love it, um, is going up. And this actual is a recent number from April. So we're almost up, not quite up, to 7.2 billion. It's not 7 billion, it was just yesterday, right? Okay, and that's the US population. You can go to the census. Um, got the on site and look at the numbers ticking over slowly. <laughs> it's actually interesting. Everyone's all going to the slide. But there's some really good news here. Um, UN figures, so we're here at 214 with our population growth rate of about 1%. And it's headed down. They're actually projecting that we may get down to zero population growth rate by 2050. And that would be a wonderful thing. Um, I would argue that we need to get down, if the negative population growth, get down to about 2.5 billion again. Not just because it's reminiscent of the year that I was born, because that's actually probably better in terms of the carrying capacity of the planet. Now, <clears throat> the two obvious ways you get there, women's education, literacy, and numeracy. If that woman becomes a lot more valuable as someone who can fill a job and earn the income and support for her family, the first baby is delayed and the number of children that family has is typically much lower. And obviously, it'd be the whole spectrum of reproductive health care available around the world and not have blocks to that. And there are many, many couples around the world that would like to use contraception and don't have it available. And those are the solutions. 
All right, land use, second. Simply, deforestation, desertification. Um, most of the deforestation that took place in the northern hemisphere um, has already happened, basically. Some areas like Japan are actually doing afforestation, afforestation, that is the growing forest that never was before. But there's a lot going on, again, in the southern hemisphere, in the tropics in general. Now, these areas are turned into desert, and you see how they're going to reflect a lot more light. Okay, now I need some audience participation here. We're going to look at the big picture. Okay, where's Cuba? Where's Hawaii? Think fast. Oh, Yell it out. Can you see it? Hawaii is to the left. Good. You can say that if you like. But what do you mean by left? You want to say it yeah. west, yeah. east, north, south? No. It's our southernmost state. That should help. <coughs> we turn over to right. Okay. Yeah. Cuba to left. Yeah. Oh. That's Cuba. That's Hawaii. We're so used to looking at you know the north oh. being a couple of Okay, right? All right, let's make it easier. Okay. Okay, <coughs> now you can see Hawaii. You can see Cuba. We're good? Okay. What else besides artificial light? you think you could see? Oh, key question. What time of the year is this picture? What time of the year is that picture? When is it? Why do you say that? A lot of ice in the A lot of ice, exactly. Right. What area of ice now will melt, the sea ice in the, in the Arctic will melt? The area the size of the 48 states. That's how much melts. So this is going to be somewhere in winter, early spring. That's the time of year, and this is a nighttime photograph. Okay, what are, what are the sources of light besides electric light? What are the sources of light? Oh, I've already done that slide. Okay. <laughs> so, interplanetary probe took a picture of that. I don't know if that's the Aurora Borealis or the Aurora Australis around the South Pole, but that's the only time I've ever seen an Aurora in a big circle. Natural gas flare, heinous waste, shouldn't be done. A volcano from the space station, who's an astronaut taking his own picture for his family, bioluminescent. There may be others. And I post this question for, for people. If you can come up with another idea of light that you would see from the planet, let me know. I haven't thought of anything else. All right. Now, why, simple question, seemingly simple at least. Why does the Earth photograph better in daylight? What do you mean? Of course it's going to photograph better in daylight. Why? We've well, got light to photograph it with. Why do you have light? Because a camera captures well, light. Well, the sun, yes. sun is reflected in something. Yes, right. The, an the answer is, obviously, it's reflecting light. Yeah. So let's go back for a sec. I can do this. Don't worry. <laughs> really can't do that. Okay. This is not going to work. Okay. So the camera better in sunlight because everything reflects light. Even water, even dark things reflect sunlight. In fact, how much of the light is reflected? What proportion is reflected? 30. 30. 30. 30. Good. All right. How many cyclonic systems do you see? Cyclones are counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. Uh, How many do you see? Two. I see, two. I see, yeah, two. Good. Okay, there's one obvious one. You can see the eye. Okay, of Mexico. <coughs> right out here, Iceland also. There's a lot of variation shape, but basically only two cyclonic, cyclonic systems I see. All right, what planet is this? Barb, you can't answer. Mercury. Mercury. Next guess. Mars. Next Earth. guess. Venus. Earth. Earth. Who said Earth? Good, good, good. Okay. What part of the planet? This is Earth. What part of Earth? What hemisphere? Ooh. Come on. I can't see any features. Yes, you can. I'm telling you, I can see features. East or west? Which, west. Which, which, which part of the spectrum is this? I'll give you a clue. Eastern. Okay, Eastern Hemisphere. That's that kind. Oh, okay. What kind of space-based telescope took this picture? This is an actual photograph of you. Infrared. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Good one, Steve. Ready for this one? <laughs> what time of day is it? <laughs> and why? Night. After midnight. Why after midnight? What are the colors mean? The darker the red, the deeper the red, the more infrared is being picked up by the camera. Well, that's space time. Okay. Afternoon. What time of day or night would it be? Okay, what's, let me ask it this way. What's hotter, land or ocean? Land. 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 When does that happen? During the day. The land changes its temperature faster, remember, than ocean. So it has to be pretty much later in the afternoon or early oh, in the oh, evening. Okay. Right. Exactly, yeah. So you, were, you were definitely there. Okay. Now, here's the tough one. I think. Come on. Okay, why are the clouds white? Because they're reflecting the light. light. They're reflecting the light, not heat. Not Any other ideas? They're cool. Well, what does white mean? White means this, an infrared it's all, camera. It's all false, false color, it's right? Cool? It, no, it's not false color. This is an actual infrared photograph. It's not, 
Well, we're actually registered for red. They're blocking the infrared from leaving the planet. There you go. That's why clouds are white. Oh. All right. So now we have to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum just briefly. Don't panic. Okay. First of all, this is where we see that narrow portion of the spectrum right there, visible light. Okay. And the long wave radiation is this way. Here's AM and FM and microwave. And out of this end, you get the X-ray and gamma ray, and it's the most intense by far. And some creatures can see it just outside of our visual range. Yeah, here it is widening, so you can see it. That's visible light. A pit viper has a pit, a little depression, that can sense infrared, so they can see a little bit of the infrared. And some birds of prey, so they can see the urine trails in their prey. And some insects can see into the ultraviolet. So for example, a lot of flowers, if you photograph them with ultraviolet filter, filters, have patterns on them and have landing strips for the insects to come in and pollinate that we can't see. Take more while to figure out what these probably mean. See if you agree with these guesses. Near infrared, short wave infrared, mid midwave infrared, long wave infrared, very long wave infrared, probably. Okay, so this is infrared. All right. Now, <coughs> there are four fundamental forces in the universe besides small children waking up from a nap. Gravity, right there. electromagnetism, which is what this is. The strong and weak subnuclear forces, which we can totally ignore. I'll tell you right now: the strong and, su and weak, the strong and weak subnuclear forces happen only inside the nucleus, only there, no place else. So the only two kinds of forces otherwise that operate at a distance are gravity and electromagnetism, and that's going to be important. All right, <clears throat> look at these four pictures, and tell me which of these could be emitting heat. I'll give you a hint: the one at top. That electric um, burner has been turned off for a day. You could put your hand on it, it might even feel a little bit cool to get, you know, transmits heat through it so easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which of these, how many of these are emitting heat? All of them. All of them, good, why? Because everything emits heat unless it's absolutely zero. Absolutely. I know where you figured that out. <laughs> all right, so here's the way. And all of us right now are emitting even more heat right now. So when your partner is getting dressed up to go out, you can say, boy, baby, you're looking hot. And actually, they are, because everything is radiating heat toward you. Everything in this room is radiating heat towards you, and you are radiating heat in every direction. Everything is radiating, unless it's at absolute zero. So, what in the world is a black body? It's not a kind of bird. All right, a black body is anything that absorbs a wide spectrum of radiation and then emits some of it back, typically at a longer wave. So they absorb a wide spectrum and then emit long wave, which is infrared radiation. And all of us are black bodies. Every solid object is a black body. Clouds are black bodies. Liquids are black bodies. What's the temperature of a black body? How would you measure it? It's not its temperature on the Fahrenheit scale. It's not on the Celsius scale. Let's look and see what these temperatures actually are. Okay, hey, we're all familiar with the Fahrenheit scale, scale because we're one of the few countries in the world that still uses it, right? <laughs> Everybody else uses centigrade and Celsius, and scientists use the Kelvin scale. And essentially, the Kelvin scale, zero is absolute zero, where there's no molecular motion. Remember, temperature is nothing but a measure of the jiggling atoms and molecules moving around, including in, say, the atmosphere. All right, so for them, to get up to freezing, you have to be at 273.15 degrees Kelvin just to get to freezing. So if your date is getting ready to go out, and you say, boy, you look really hot, you must be 300 degrees cold. That's what's going on. So look at these actual temperatures. Look, that cold burner on the stove is actually 294 degrees Kelvin. Okay, close to 300. And we're probably close to 300. All right, now, we're going back to high school physics, high school science class. What are the only three ways for heat energy to move out? Remember, heat energy is not a fundamental force. It's nothing but the jiggling of things. So the only three ways, and here they are. Thermodynamics. I have a t-shirt that I should have brought. Actually, it's for a different lecture. I want to do a thermal. But basically it says, the first law of thermodynamics is, don't talk about thermodynamics. Well, that's obviously not the actual phrasing. And I'm going to talk about thermodynamics, but don't worry, you already know this. And I'm serious. Only two of the laws. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy is neither created or destroyed. Now, could anybody honestly admit they've never heard that phrase before? You've heard that. Okay, Bart, you, you have not been listening to me then. 
All right, first law of thermodynamics, need to create a story, only change forms. The second one, second law is just entropy. You heat up a cup of tea, you put it on the counter, you forget about it, you come back an hour later, and it's no longer hot. Things tend to go into sort of greater disarray, greater disorder, greater entropy. It's a little more complex than that. But thus, we both basically have a good intuitive sense of what these things are. All right, so the transfer of heat. The pan is a solid object. If you touch a hot pan, the handle of a hot pan, without having an oven bed, I suppose, um, solid object, a solid object, it conducts heat. That's conduction, okay? And all the bouncing molecules inside the pan bounce and start making all the molecules in your hand bounce around, and it hurts. It can burn. <laughs> hey, now, if you're so foolish, and you take your other hand, and you dip it into the water that's near boiling to see if it's ready yet, okay? Now you have a liquid or a gas. Maybe it's steaming. You put your hand right above the steam coming out of a teapot. Okay, so if you have a gas or liquid that is transferring the heat versus a solid, these are almost the same, aren't they? Okay, so you have conduction and convection really being almost the same. The third way is radiation. And that's if you're, say, 15 feet from a hot morning fire on a cold fall night, and you're upwind, so there's no warm air being blown toward you. And yet, you can feel on your face. You feel that. Okay, that's electromagnetic radiation. And the particular part of the spectrum is infrared. That's what infrared radiation is. So you have to have, excuse me, you have to have line of sight. It can be close or it can be far. It's going to drop off at a square distance. But basically, line of sight. Okay, so here's my question. And I haven't seen this anyplace else. So I'm going to call this really the Lawrence Thermos Bottle Theory of Global Warming. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's only fair. And here's the way it works. What is a thermos bottle? How does it work? It has a vacuum. Right? It has two walls, an inner wall and an outer wall, and a vacuum. And we're going to assume, for the sake of argument, that that space in between is a hard vacuum, meaning there's almost nothing there. That's really hard to do this, even in a lab. Even out in deep space, that's really a very hard vacuum, but maybe a little bit of activity out there, ignoring, ignoring quantum effects. Okay, so in that vacuum, you have a few, 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 few molecules, but the temperature out in space, 3 degrees Kelvin. That's pretty darn cold. I mean, helium turns to a liquid by that point. It's about four and a half degrees, I call. So our planet is not a ship in a bottle. Our planet is a planet in a transparent thermos bottle. So it's surrounded by vacuum. And it turns out the temperature of vacuum is absolutely irrelevant in terms of convection and conduction because there are no molecules that are touching it. It all comes down to radiation. That's the only way to get heat in and out of the planet. That is the only way to get heat in and out of the planet. The heat coming in has to balance the heat going out. If it doesn't, if you're trapping too much in, then the planet has to warm up to the point that it can start sending more infrared out. So it has to get hotter and hotter until that balance and equilibrium is achieved again. The hard way of heat, besides electromagnetic, is actually using gravity. I said that's the other one that moves through a vacuum, right, and moves at a distance. So it turns out the volcanic moon Io by Jupiter is sort of racked and twisted and pulled on its crust, so it has some volcanic activity that a small object like that shouldn't have. It's because of the, the huge gravitational field of Jupiter. So you can actually, with gravity, cause a lot of frictional changes inside that moon of Io and cause it to be warmer. So that's tiny heat of the crust, not a fluid. All right, so we know that solids, clouds, people, Liquids are all black bodies. Greenhouse gases are not black bodies. They are very, very selective in what they will absorb in terms of energy. Very, very selective. Only one part of the spectrum, typically. And that's it. They can then radiate out infrared, but they can only accept certain kinds of light radiation. They are invisible, basically, to shortwave, visible, and ultraviolet light. So we're looking at each other, and we're looking right through the atmosphere using visible light. You can also look for a solid when you look out through the window, but that's another story. All right, when a greenhouse gas has absorbed some shortwave radiation, it can then either be um, more active in terms of its molecular motion. I'll show you what CO2 can do. CO2 can spin around more, it can bounce off other molecules and move faster, or because it has two oxygen atoms, right? They can do various things. They can bounce up and down. They can do this kind of thing. They can do this. I could make a dance step on this. <laughs> okay. So, or they can re-emit the energy in infrared. I need a little bit of each. OK, 
Okay, so that so greenhouse gases get a very selective absorbers. They are not black bodies. Okay, so this is does this seem clear? Okay, so remember that sphere at the top of the atmosphere, the planet. You cannot conduct heat into a vacuum. You cannot conduct heat in, a, in through a vacuum with conduction or with convection, only with radiation. Okay? All right. So greenhouse gases fail to constitute a black body. All right, we have to know a few things about the atmosphere, but not all of this stuff. Just a couple of things. The troposphere is where we live. Okay, it holds 90% of the mass of the atmosphere, almost all the moisture, and therefore all the weather. All weather happens in the troposphere. And where the air is warm by the equator, it's like a 10, it's like a 10 kilometer race, six miles straight up. That's the top of the troposphere. And at the poles, it's about half that or less. It's very cold and the air condenses down. And as you're going up, you notice the temperature drops to about minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very cold here. And that's actually important in a couple of ways. <coughs> Now, the other thing that happens is that in the mid-stratosphere, the next level up, the only level we need to talk about, mid-stratosphere is where you have the highest concentration of ozone, and ozone is very important. Um, before we had ozone, a lot more ultraviolet, very high energy ultraviolet, hit the surface of the planet. I personally sunburn very easily. I can get a sunburn in 30 minutes. My wife is still amazed. But before we had the ozone layer up there, there was more than 30 times as much ultraviolet. I could have gotten sunburned in less than a minute. And most microbial life anywhere near the surface would die. Life really couldn't really begin to expand, become multicellular, do a lot of complicated things until we started chilling out the ultraviolet. So, we talked about the thermos bottle, and it turns out that the that gravity, the stratospheric ozone, and especially the tropopause, this kind of top layer here above the, trop the troposphere, that is the inner wall of the thermos model of our planet. What's the outer wall? The other side of the universe. Not that it has sides. But basically, we have the best hard vacuum thermos model you could imagine being in a planet that has an atmosphere for an inner layer and then has that hard vacuum that does not let heat come in and out except by radiation. Isn't that fun? All right. Now, Question now, how can the invisible atmosphere reflect light? Incoming visible light, how can it reflect light? Particles in the air. Particles in the air, good. The best way to do that is clouds. Now this is the thing that the IPCC has made several of the, of the uh, multiple reports they have done very clear. This is one of the hardest things to model. There are three basic kinds of clouds and they have different effects on the energy balance. So the first type, here are cirrus. Now these can be up as high as 20,000 feet tropic layer, 60 where we are um, about two thirds of that. So they can be well over 10,000 feet. And they have much less, less moisture. You can see, you see these wispy clouds here, very little water, as much as 100%, I mean 100 fold less water than the really heavy clouds. <coughs> and they are transparent or translucent to um, the visible light. How can a cloud be transparent? You can't see it then. Well, then it has to be instrumental. Instruments can detect very tiny levels of cirrus cloud out there. So they are, however, opaque to infrared light. Remember those clouds that are white in that infrared photograph? Okay. So the daytime net effect is they will warm the Earth because they let almost all the light through, but they don't let the infrared back out. The nighttime effect is that they warm the Earth. So cirrus clouds warm the Earth. Now, not to mention back on, we were talking about the levels of the atmosphere. Um, because it's so cold in the tropopause, any water vapor that gets there freezes in the crystals and forms clouds like this. And these clouds don't rain exactly. They're too far away to see, I guess, without instruments. But they have fall streaks of ice crystals that come out. Now, if this did not happen, if the water vapor could get further out into the atmosphere, the high energy ultraviolet would hit it, break it apart. You'd end up with hydrogen escaping the planet. And by now, four and a billion years, like Mars, almost, and Venus, certainly, there'd be no water on the planet. We wouldn't be here. So the atmosphere is very important because it traps all the water on the planet. But we like water, don't we? All right, cumulus clouds. I think the cumulus clouds is like a hot air balloon. It's a pretty focal area, very warm air. Here's a trick question for you. Don't read the slide yet. Is moist air more buoyant or less buoyant than dry air? That was the fan. 
Oh, 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 oh. Okay. I think it turned itself off. Well, it wasn't buoyant. You didn't like that question. Okay, so <laughs> moist air. Moist air. Buoyant or not? <laughs> it is buoyant. Why would moist air be buoyant? You'd think with water vapor in the air, air should be heavier, right? It feels heavy right now. It's moist air, right? Okay, the regular dry atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, so two nitrogen atoms together, and 21% diatomic oxygen, two oxygen atoms together. That's 99% of the dry atmosphere. You put water vapor in it, anywhere from 0 to 4%. Water has one um, oxygen atom, but it has two hydrogen. So it actually makes it lighter. So moist air is buoyant and goes up like a balloon and helps form clouds. And you can see these thunderheads. You can just imagine that moist air rising up, cooling, and then precipitating out. That's what's going on. Now these clouds, unlike cirrus, um, can cause heavy rain. They can cause lightning. And they definitely function as a, as a black body, more so than cirrus. You can just see the amount of shading taking place by that cloud. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's called nimbus, by the way, if it's raining, so cumulonimbus. All right, next one, stratus, and last one. This is one version of stratus. This is over a much wider area and a lesser amount of moisture. So it gets up to a certain level and forms pretty thin clouds, but it can rain. And this is our famous Washington beach drizzle. We see this kind of thing all the time. And this is a version that just aesthetically is called a mackerel sky because it looks like the scales on a fish. And again, an IPCC statement in the box. And this one talks about how modeling clouds is really complicated and give some of the widest uncertainty then. Okay, so the effect of these last two types of clouds is they cool the planet in the daytime. If it's cloudy outside, it's not as hot, right? But they definitely warm it up at night. So imagine multiple cloud types forming and reforming, different altitudes, having different effects. It's very hard to model. This is about their, their hardest task. All right. So here's kind of the summary cloud on cloud, the summary slide on cloud. You can see that we have the sun as a black body, 5,780 degrees Kelvin. That's very hot. So it has ultraviolet, visible, infrared radiation. Here's the Earth down here, much lower temperature. Um, and if we were leaving Bellingham, you can tell us we're going. If you're leaving Bellingham, you're going from one climate to another. But for now, just for this idea, a lot of the visible light comes through the cloud, especially with cirrus, but to some degree with the others. You can see light coming through the clouds. They may be gray, but they're not dark black on the bottom, for example. And any energy they absorb of either visible light or infrared from the sun can either be converted then into jiggling molecules or can be re-radiated, but only as infrared. And okay, they don't glow, they don't glow with visible light. And notice there's no directionality to that. A given atom that's about to give off infrared photon it could go in any direction. So mathematically, about half the time it goes up, or sort of parallel, half the time it goes down. OK, here's the bonus slide. Rainbows. So I tried to get as many bees in there as I could. Bows are bonuses even without bullying. That is, with no gold at the end of the rainbow. So how does this work? OK, now that we're talking about light. So it turns out that in one of the raindrops up there, the light comes in. It refracts or bends a little bit, but different colors bend at slightly different angles. They have an index of refraction. Some of it bounces off, and the raindrop comes back out, refracting again, and some of it goes on through. Okay, that's the basic way you do it. And those would be angles here for red and for purple. So the rainbow is between 40 and 42 degrees. And the primary rainbow is always red on top. The secondary rainbow is always red on the bottom. But just briefly, the secondary rainbow forms because sometimes the light bounces twice inside the raindrop before it comes out. Oh, Pardon? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the secondary rainbow. And that was out between, if I didn't cut it off too far, between 51 and 53, as I recall, 54, 54 degrees. And why are they fuzzy? Well, because raindrops aren't exactly spherical. Small ones are. And then you get odd shapes like this. That's why they're fuzzy. So if you get really, really bright drops lifting up in the air, then you'll see sharper bands. Except, you only see bands because of the physiology of the retina. If you take a black and white picture of a rainbow, and here's one, here's the primary, here's the secondary, you notice there are no bands in there. Again, it's just an artifact of our vision, the kind of photoreceptors that we have. And notice that if you're not human, but instead another kind of creature, you might see a different rainbow. So who would see further in to the red side? Who sees more into infrared? A bird. A bit viper. A bit viper, I like these better answer. Okay, now who sees more into the ultraviolet? Bees. Okay, whoops, wrong direction. It does go for a bird. Okay, so a bird prey. Okay, so this seems slightly different rainbow. 
Now, it's not that one of these drops of rain out here is only sending red out in every direction. If you had only a single drop of rain out there, and then you ran around in the field, you could see the whole rainbow in the drop. It's sending out all the parts of the spectrum, but just at different angles. Okay, so that's the bonus. I have a question. Huh? Yes? I've read that if you're in an airplane in the cockpit, and you see a rainbow, you can actually see the whole... I've circle. seen that myself, just as a passenger. Yeah, okay, you see a circle of rainbow. Really? Because every part that you see yeah. is between 40 and 42 degrees. Between That's the angle of the drop between you and the sun. Wow. That's why you see a full circle. Cool. All right, who knows who Willie Sutton is? I'm looking forward to the answer here. Okay, good. And the reason I bring him up, because we used to use this all the time, Willie Sutton's law. What's Willie Sutton's law? He always robs banks because that's where the money is. He finally got arrested. He was a notorious bank robber, probably a century ago or more. And he was finally... Um, at, when caught, was finally asked by a group of reporters, so, so really, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. There's an aside to that story. He later denied having said that, so that may have been a creation by a journalist. Not that they ever make up a quote. Like <laughs> All right, so the point is that here's where we have vision, and other creatures have vision a little bit further, past violet, not ultraviolet, a little bit past red into, into infrared, okay? Why did the more than 20 times that eyes have developed, why did they all develop in this area of the spectrum of light coming from the sun? Because there's more energy. This is the spectrum. This is the amount. For example, at 600 nanometers, billions of a meter at that frequency, there's a lot of energy coming through. So if you're going to evolve an eye over time, and that's another whole lecture, evolve an eye over time, do it with a lot of energy. So you have something to see with. Okay, so Willie Sutton's law argued that this would be a very sensible place to develop vision in that part of the spectrum. Now, this is important. Look how much of the energy coming from the sun is actually infrared. 49%. How much visible? 46. Ultraviolet? 5%. A lot of it's infrared. When you're lying on the beach and you feel really warm in the sun, it's not just that visible light's hitting your skin and being converted into heat energy of your molecules. You're actually under a, an infrared lamp. A lot of that energy coming is infrared that's hitting you. And the sun is only in one direction. Okay? So, here's the trick. We know now that we're in a thermos bottle. And we have to emit as much energy as we receive, or our average temperature is going to change. So the Earth has to radiate energy, notice, in every direction. Every part of a sphere. So daytime, nighttime, anytime. It's radiating infrared out to get it back out again. You know, it bounces off also 30% of the visible. Okay. So the reason that the planet can heat up is because you start, you start blocking the amount of infrared that can get out. And right now, CO2 is blocking a lot of the infrared that's trying to get out of the thermos bottle. We know the sun is a much hotter and bigger black body. Okay, so we have CO2 here, we have uh, methane down here, a little bit of ozone, you can't see much here, but the, the chlorofluorocarbon and such, nitrous oxide, like in the dentist, um, sulfur dioxide, and so forth. So there are all different chemicals in the, in the atmosphere that change where things get absorbed. So notice again, ozone is important, but CO2, mostly. Okay. So we know the sun is a lot hotter than the Earth. The question is, why are we, not, why are we, not, why are we in balance anyway? Why were we in balance before the Industrial Revolution? And here are the three answers. Okay, first of all, we talked about albedo, reflectance. 30% of the light doesn't stay, immediately goes back out again. And you can calculate, of the 70% that stays, you could do, you could spend some considerable time with um, advanced calculus and figure out how much, because they bear over the different portions of the planet that are seeing the sun, the different angles and so forth. Or you can just decide, okay, let's assume the planet is like an orange, you cut it in half, the amount of light blocked out by that is the shadow of the Earth, and therefore that's the amount of sun that's hitting the planet. See how simple that is? Mm -hmm. That's simple. Okay, so what's the surface area of the planet compared to that? It turns out mathematically it works out really neatly. Four times greater. So the first answer is you have four times as much surface area trying to shed heat versus the one part that is accepting heat when the sun is shining. Okay, so it's that differential geometry, four to one ratio. Second thing is the albedo at 30%. And then of the absorption, a portion of that 70% gets re-emitted out of the thermos bottle. All right, 
components of the climate system, cryosphere, ice and snow, geosphere, land, hydrosphere, water, everywhere, biosphere, that's us, atmosphere, it's full of milk there, atmosphere is not the same, you know that. All right, so which spheres of those five components of the geophysical system, what spheres absorb a light energy and what, or reflect it? Which of these spheres reflect light? All of them. All of them, exactly. Which one exhibits the highest albedo or reflectance? Of course, the cryosphere. Right? We're not going to go over all of these. Thanks, honey. Okay. So, notice, snow, fresh snow, especially powder, reflects up to 90% of the visible light. It reflects a lot of the UV. If I go out in a snowy area and I wear a hat and the sun never hits my nose, I still get a sunburned nose because ultraviolet is bouncing off. But guess what? Infrared pretty much doesn't. So it doesn't matter how cold it is, what the temperature is outside, the air temperature, the infrared can be melting snow. All right. So ice sheets, polar sea ice, permafrost and methane hydrates, mountain glaciers, seasonal snow cover. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by landmass with variable sea ice, and the Antarctic is a huge landmass surrounded by sea with very different currents and different winds. All right. I told you this would get complicated. Aerosols. We all think we know what an aerosol is. We use spray cans and paint comes out or hairspray or whatever else. What you're actually seeing is not an aerosol, it's a suspension, but the stuff that's really tiny, okay, like a micron or less or close to it, um, that's actually the aerosol, not the suspension. So a colloid is when you have solid particles of liquid or liquid in a, in a gas. Tapioca pudding is a colloid, one of my favorite colloids actually. <laughs> And it turns out that some of the most important, um, one of the most important aerosols are um, sulfur. So you can get sulfur dioxide from anthropogenic sources, a coal plant burning, for example. You can get it from volcanoes also. And then dimethyl sulfide, DMS. And that comes from biogenic uh, sources, mainly marine plankton. So those are the two forms. And the way I remember a micron, it's all those different ways. Those all say the same thing. Is our red blood cell, a healthy, normal red blood cell is 10 microns, so it's one tenth of a red cell. It's very tiny. But notice in those red cells, there's some variation in shape, right? Okay, and there's also something where the black arrows are. Any idea what parasite is in those red blood, actually inside those red blood cells? Well, it's not particularly easy to know unless you're a laboratory technician, but these are signet ring forms of malaria. And I bring this up in a climate talk because that's one of the tropical diseases that's probably going to become more widespread. I've only been involved in treating malaria maybe, maybe a dozen times. It's a lot of fun to treat. All right. Don't panic. These are the types of things that aerosolize. Mineral, rock dust, pollen, spores, bacteria, black carbon, organic carbon, take from power plants. We just talked about sulfur dioxide, dimethyl sulfide, and then sea salt. You see breaking waves in the ocean, um, little bubbles pop and some salt spray goes up and you end up with some salt in the air. So these are all the different types of aerosol. Now some of them directly scatter or absorb the radiation and some of them simply act as condensation nuclei so you get clouds. And then they're, dry, they're deposited back either dryly or wetly in precipitation. So aerosol is important though because they actually do change the climate. And they have a net cooling effect, typically. All right, so can this really change the climate? Here's a volcano erupting. And it's injecting material, including sulfate, up into the stratosphere. Remember, all the weather essentially takes place in the troposphere, so it's too high. It could take a year or two for that to settle out of the stratosphere. Or in the Mount Toba, super eruption could take centuries. Okay? All right, could it change the climate? All right, this is what's called an existence proof. This happened in 1991 in the Philippines. Mount put a tubo blue, and it really blew. About a cubic mile of material got ejected. And actually more than that. And the area of, the, of it, this rising material ended up being about the size of Iowa. It stayed in the atmosphere for a long time. So from 1991 through into 1993, it dropped the average surface temperature of the planet by about half a degree centigrade. So yes, volcanoes can change things dramatically. All right, here are two, two photographs. Colorized versions showing things that can float around in the atmosphere and change them. Two kinds of aerosols. And the four colors of light blue, be like here, and that's sea salt. Light green is smoke from forest fires. You look at Brazil, parts of Africa. Um, dull white is sulfate particles. Again, I'm missing my laser corner. But up here, see, coming off North America, coming off China. 
and this is from NASA, and they basically colorized from the satellite sensor of all the different aerosols in there. And the reddish orange is dust, dust from Africa in particular. It's coming with a northwesterly and, uh, and southwesterly um, uh, trade winds and brought over even to our continent from Africa. Okay, so could volcanoes be the main culprit in terms of producing global climate change? God, could they be reducing the majority of the carbon dioxide or the sulfate? Well, in theory, they can. They can if there's a lot of volcanic activity, and certainly at times during the Earth's history that has happened, but that's not what's happening now. So instead, what's going on now? This shows us kind of a close up view near Iceland. That's ice up there, and that's the sulfate being released from, say, the power plants, the East Coast, that sort of thing. Okay, so it turns out that the average year, volcanoes re release about 13% of the sulfur into the atmosphere, sulfates, the aerosols. And the average year, only 1% of the carbon dioxide. So don't listen to those commentators on TV. This is not the culprit in climate warming. It's still mainly human. So where do all that carbon heat go? Almost all of it goes into the ocean, at least at this part in the cycle. So more than 90% of that heat goes into the ocean. The ocean is what's getting warm. It has 800 times the heat content of air. So that's a lot of heat going on there. Um, we know that the mixing is slow, again, 70% of Earth's surface. The upper, and obviously when you heat up the ocean, and for that matter, when you put CO2 in the ocean, there's ocean mixing going on all the time. And it takes about a year to mix the top 700 meters. It turns out in the last decade and a half or so, a lot of the heat got down below 700 meter, meters. So deep down, we don't have many devices down there monitoring that. But we need more, of course. The cold of missile water below 2,000 meters takes centuries. That takes a long, long time to get cold. So there's a huge amount of heat and a huge amount of carbon storage in the ocean. So at this point, you can remember that over 90% is taking place in the world ocean. And the consensus seems to be, and you can go to the, uh, the uh, ENSO Prediction Center um, for, um, for NOAA, the, uh, North Bear, or the uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration um, in the Department of Energy. And you can see their current monthly prediction of how likely it is we're going to have an El Nino this year. That's looking very likely. In which case, that's going to, without going into the whole mechanics of El Nino, a lot of the heat's going to come back out, and so we may see some real heating this year and the next couple of years of that. Okay, so we need a quick break, I can tell. Of these cartoons, this is my favorite for the banana peel. <laughs> but I bring this up because it turns out there's a commonality of arguments and also a commonality of people and a commonality of funding of people that deny climate change just the way that they were denying evolution before and the health effects of tobacco before. Some of the same people and companies and consultants have been hired again. And I'm going to give you one example of the kinds of things they can do. It's called cherry picking. And here's the way it works. Now, this was a science journalist, not a scientist, Canadian, published an opinion piece in April of last year. And he said, no, in the last 24 years, the Arctic is, uh, now has more sea ice than it did before. Well, he, should, he picked one day. <laughs> he picked April 14th in 89. And then 24, four year later, 24 years later, then picked another day. That same day, April 14th, said, OK, so it's actually going up. All right, I don't have any laser pointer, but what do you think that curve is doing? No. Well, right? So he's purposely, purposely prevaricating. I'm All right, so that's true. All right, we're almost lying. Like, we are very close to that. Pardon me? Just use the word lying. Oh, lying. OK. Right. So purposely <laughs> trying to distort. There are some people clearly trying to distort the information. When I see this slide, I know we're almost done. All right, so energy in, energy out. Measure is watts per square meter on top of the atmosphere. If it doesn't equal each other, then you're in disequilibrium and you have to either heat up or cool down and get back to equilibrium at this point where heat up for This is called something like a waterfall, waterfall chart by the um, IPCC. And you can see that of those things that are increasing trapping of heat, CO2 and methane are almost all of them. Okay? There's a minor component, the halo carbons. Those are chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, hydrofluorofluorocarbons. Nitrous oxide, like when my wife went to the dentist recently, they don't recapture the nitrous oxide, it goes to the atmosphere. Um, carbon monoxide for complete combustion typically, non-methane, volatile, organic uh, compounds. And then the others, aerosols, directly or aerosols by making clouds, take things in the opposite direction. The net effect, 2.29. That's the figure. 2.29 watts per meter. That's what's going on, oh, per square meter. Okay. All right, now we're going to look at the same data, different chart. And just bring this up. Look how the error bars are here for aerosols, okay, and also for clouds. 
whereas the ones that are much tighter, the CO2, methane, and so forth. And so when I was born in 1950, the um, amount of industrial change at industrial age stage was just to here. And now in 2011, see, that's where we're still stuck with that number, 2.29, as of 2011, in the degree center. Wow. All right. So being scientists, they had to come up with this truly awkward name, representative concentration pathways. They couldn't come up with a better name than that. Um, this is not, so these are RCPs, these are not the RCNP, the Royal Canadian Medical Police. So if that helps you remember it, fine. If not, ignore that. Okay, so what they gave you, what they give you, you get a choice, you get to check off the box of what you'd like to see, is just points along the spectrum. There are points even higher, there are all the points in between. If we rapidly mitigate, we make a lot of changes, we get the CO2, we get up to 421, we add another degree centigrade to where we are now. And if we're above one, our place is above two, and we start seeing some feedbacks. Okay, if we do stabilization, but more slowly, we get to a CO2 of 538, and a temperature rise of 1.8 degrees centigrade, and so forth. These are all open data. You can go to, to the executive summary, the IPCC, published in October last year. There's more recent statements by them as well, covering other areas. Okay, is there a difference between the, the short-term and the long-term climate sensitivity? And the answer is, of course, yes. All right, so climate sensitivity, again, an awkward term. It just means if you double baseline CO2, how much of a temperature rise do you expect to see? And a lot of data point towards 3 degrees centigrade from baseline, if you double the CO2. So a lot of the estimates deal with that. Now, there are, the time span is very important. If you're talking just in decades, that's the transient climate response. So before the end of the century, one to two and a half degrees centigrade, depending on which of those scenarios we follow. Equilibrium climate sensitivity takes multiple centuries, and we're looking at this kind of range. There was a paper in Nature just in January arguing that this lower limit here, it should not have been so conservative, it should be three. Three to four point five. And then the Earth system sensitivity, which takes millennia, thousands of years, is even higher, of course. But in terms of organizing people and talking about things that need to be done, you really need to talk about the things before the end of the century. You just won't get people over there. Because these are very complicated systems, obviously. And I'm not trying to clarify much about them, but it's on. Now, question for you. So, baseline 280, we hit 400 last May. I don't know where we are. It's easy to look up from day to day. Um, so, it's going up about 2.2 parts per million per year. So, how long would it take? to double, to get to 560. How many more years would it take? So if you could grab a calculator, you could just let me tell you. 100? 73 years. So one human lifetime now. If you have a young grandchild, by the time, before they're an old person, we could have double the CO2 in the atmosphere. So we don't have loads of time to work with. That's our dilemma. Okay, I would suggest that this might be a good point to stop. I mean, there are other slides. I can keep talking for another hour. Or two, but, but I think this actually would be a good time to talk. I suspect there may be comments, um, other points you'd like to make. But I know it's been a long evening as is. Anyone know what time it is? 9 o'clock. OK, there we go. We're supposed to be 7 to 9. We'll stop at 9. That was excellent. Thank you. It really was. Yeah, it's a lot of data to organize. It's been a lot of number crunching and such. Yeah, yeah you basically turned a, a hose on us, you know. Yeah. And, uh, well, <laughs> the only thing that's really novel, I think, to me, is just the idea of a thermos bottle. I think it helps explain. Yeah, question, come in. Yeah, I had the other one uh, was uh, the, the started column of global warming climate change. Well, the climate's been changing for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's really accurate at all. You know, I don't know why they abandoned something that was... We've had an ice ball. We've had an ice ball world. We've had a, a total hot house world. Now it's been a wide variation over the last four and a half billion years. I will grant you that. Um, global warming was perhaps not the best term to use initially because everybody assumed that is any sort of very non-scientist. Well, okay, if everything's getting a little bit warmer, then everything's getting a little bit warmer. We should see temperatures going up everywhere. And actually, it'll, it'll be the reverse. I mean, some places will get colder, some places will get drier, some get wetter, and so forth. Um, there is a greater total amount of energy inside the Earth system. And so you can call it global climate change, which is anthropogenic. I don't like the phrase. Global climate weirding, which is, you know, aim, uh, which is Hunter Lovin's name. I like that one, global weirding or climate weirding. Use whatever term you like, actually. Any other comments?
Yeah, I was just going to say, there was, I mentioned this earlier, but there was an article in the Times and a couple other places just in the last couple of weeks about the fact that in Florida, on one of the main streets of Miami Beach, I think it's called Acton Boulevard, which is a real popular street, on a warm, sunny, blue sky day, the level of water that's just been rising is now starting to bring some streets in Miami to like Venice where water is, you know, just from the natural calm rise is, is like spilling around the street levels. Yeah. Or, you know, actually, you know, the, 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 uh, the downpour in Penn Yan just yes. yesterday, that's, that's another, yes. another outcome of, yeah. of global climate change, too, is you get these really intense storms, you know, and yes. just dump huge amounts of water in a very short time period. The counter, there's a counter argument to that though, and that is the statement you'll hear, you can't attribute climate change to any one particular storm. Right. And there's a counter argument to that in turn, and that's the concept of um, proportional attribution. And that is if you say, and this is the analogy used, if you have a baseball player who's had you know, a fairly stable um, uh, batting record, and then he starts taking steroids, and he starts hitting 20% more home runs. It's true, you can't say that any home run he then hits is due to the steroids. What you can say is, there's a 20% there's a chance that that home run is due to the steroids. And the same is what some scientists are now starting to say they're doing, fractional attribution. They're saying, okay, Superstorm Sandy. Superstorm Sandy was maybe was a 15% or 10%, and don't quote this figure, because I'm making up this number. Let, let's just say they say, okay, there's a 10% there's a chance a superstorm standing um, occurred because the water was hotter and because these storms are more likely, and so we can say that this is due to climate change. So fractional attribution is what's going to have to be done more, and there's a lot, there are a lot of people modeling and working on that concept. Steve. Uh, I noticed early on in that that you had like 1.2 six kilowatt of energy coming 2 in? 2.29. Oh, 2.29. Okay. It's not more that's coming in. It's more that's being trapped inside. Right. Yeah. But you're saying that of that 30% is reflected. Not of that. No, instead of the 1336, absorbed. of the total amount of the sun's energy coming in, that 1336. Okay. Okay, 30% of that bounces right back out. Of the 70% right. that's left, then you have to get rid of that. And the way it's done is, again, that multi-fold slide that I talked about. Right. Yeah. Okay. I that thirty percent is a is a big number. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a lot of energy. Yeah. You sure. disrupt that. That's mechanism. visible light. See, that's why we get yeah, we see the light. That's visible light coming in and bouncing out as visible light. Right. But so like that doesn't saying, change the energy balance. Infrared. Oh, that it's doesn't. Infrared. Yeah, that doesn't change the energy balance, and that's been going on for billions that's of years. That's just the, the way atmospheres <laughs> work. Okay. So what we're dealing with is really the 70% that doesn't bounce off, doesn't reflect, that isn't you know, affected by the concept of albedo. So of that 70%, we're now trapping an additional 2.29 watts per square meter. Yeah. Now does not the clouds in the atmosphere also do the react of reverse? They do, and that's why it's so complicated. Because the more clouds you have with extra water vapor, um, then the more reflectance you should be getting, but then it's also trapping more heat below, and then different types of clouds at different layers, moving, changing minute to minute, it's very hard to model. So it's not clear yet, and there's a lot of discussion in the literature, when you read and say science or nature, you'll see there's a lot of discussion, are we going to have more clouds 10 years from now, are we going to have fewer clouds 20 years from now? Because with more heat, you tend, of course, to evaporate the moisture in the cloud, but you're also mm -hmm. evaporating moisture that gets up there and can only come back out as precipitation. So there's, there's no variation in that 30%? Apparently not. Again, remember, that's just visible light coming in and bouncing out like a mirror. But your, heat, your heat's not transferring right, at 30%. We'll, we'll, of the 70%, yes, that does get turned into heat. Again, remember, heat's neither created or destroyed. Why, why, why does 70% remain? And 30 because, goes okay, the, the reason, we have, the reason we have color, the reason we have color is because the color that we see is what bounces off. Okay. Okay? If you have something very dark, like well, black, right. well, then it's absorbing almost is all the light. That, that, I think that 30% is, is an effect. Not if it goes back out again, because it's carrying the no, same energy. No, not if it goes in. back out, but what if some more and more is remaining? 
but at 30 percent, again, the, the amount of sun's energy is now 28 percent. Okay, but the amount of sun's energy is pretty much a near constant, and we feel good about the data okay. for there. Very strong. Right. Okay, and that fraction, 30 percent, I have never seen anything in the literature anywhere that ever said that 30 percent change. Okay, so that's only the that's a given coming in. That's okay. that's kind of like a very strong theory of physics. Okay, people can start filtering out, obviously. Question here? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Before people filter out, um, we're doing a petition drive to try to convince city council to ban hydrofracking. They put a moratorium on, and it's about protecting the water of Candace and Hemlock Lake. If you have not signed, I'd appreciate it if you would. You don't have to be a city resident. So it's open to everybody. Thank you.